Holy Spirit. Happy Amen. Feast Day. It's another one of the feasts of the Lord which we come to in this wonderful period of the Incarnation. I remember one time years ago, you've probably heard me tell the story that uh, Archbishop Dimitri was asked if we could uh, serve Old Calendar Christmas on January 7th. So people asked him about that. He said, well, as far as he was concerned from our Christmas until the Feast of the Meeting of the Lord was all a Feast of the Incarnation. It was all about the Lord's Incarnation. So serve it 40 times if you wanted to. <laughs> Many times. It indeed is that kind of feast. And this is as well. The Feast of the Circumcision is truly a feast of the Lord taking upon flesh that He might not appear just to be in the flesh. He literally underwent what the common Jewish man had to undergo to fulfill the law, to fill up the law with Himself, to foreshadow His passion by an early shedding of blood, to fill up this ritual with more grace, really to make it essentially obsolete because it was Him who filled up everything. It was the mark of Him. It was the circumcision of the heart that became important. This feast also is a feast of the name of Christ. When we call him for the first time Jesus, yes, the mother of God had heard this is what he was to be called, and Joseph had heard this, but this is the time that is proclaimed in public, as we do in the Orthodox Church, traditionally on the eighth day is the day of the naming. of the, When the name is given by the prayers of the Church, the Lord was given this name and his circumcision as well of Jesus, which of course means Savior, one who saves, he who saves. Yes, other people had had this name. Yeshua is the same name. With him, it's a bit different. God is filling it up with himself. And we learn soon that there's no other name under heaven by which men may be saved, as St. Peter tells us. St. Paul tells the Corinthians, I have determined to know nothing among you, or not, to not know a thing among you, except the name of Jesus. You hear that this is the name by which demons are cast out, the name which we are to call upon God by the name of Jesus. And no one can call Jesus Lord except by the power of the Holy Spirit. The scriptures are full and wrought over and over and over with references to the power of this beautiful name, which becomes not a mantra as some would make it now, but a name that is filled with life because it is directly addressed to a person, a concrete person, a living person, a living person who also happens to be 100% God. We call upon our prayers as if speaking to someone, not as just something abstract out in the air, hoping to make ourselves feel better, but to believe that someone actually is listening, and someone will speak back to us, and indeed does speak to our hearts. During this time period, after this event, of course, it's a very stress-filled time for this family. They are not wanted. There is no room for them in the inn, so they have to find a lowly cave. There is no room for them in Judea because Herod does not have a place for someone else with any power whatsoever, even a tiny infant. His pride could not contain another king as he saw him to be, as he thought him to be. But look out through Jesus' life. The Gadarenes ask him to leave. His own people in Nazareth to kick him out when he speaks in the temple. Over and over, people seek to destroy him because there is no place for him, no place for this name, which Paul is determined to know nothing but that name. But over and over, he is being asked to leave or forced to leave, or told to leave, every time, over and over and over. Do we have room for him in our hearts? Is there a place for this Lord? Or do we throughout each and every day, I know at points I do, push him aside? There's not room in our hearts. This is the God that fills the universe, who is more spacious than the heavens, who is a jealous God, who seeks all of our hearts, every bit that we are, not just part of us, but all that we are. Do we push him out of our hearts by putting another idol up in there? Do we put our passions up ahead of Christ, or better said, our addictions, better word for our age? Do we put entertainments, distractions, family, 
food, anything, our jobs above Christ. The church is rather empty this morning. Of course, I'm speaking to the people who are here, so that's really not fair. So, why are the churches not full every time? Last week was so beautiful, so full. But today is a feast of the Incarnation as well. Today is a Pascha as well. The churches should be jammed every time we meet. But indeed, there is a little flock, a little remnant. And we must seek to be a part of that each day, each moment of our days, to take up our cross daily, to fill up everything with Christ. Because it truly is life-altering. We accept what we have been taught last weekend, what we are taught this weekend. They can't be just partial Christians. It has to be all Christian or not Christian at all. Life has to be filled with Christ. Every decision, every thought, our will, what we eat, what we do, how we walk, how we talk, everything we do has to reflect that God is with us. We understand that ourselves. We tell the nations to understand it. That if God is with us, there is no moment, no second of the day, and God is not directly present with us. And this is a beautiful thing. Not something to fear, but something to fill our hearts up with and receive the fullness of joy, the fullness of grace, the fullness of His mercy. This great saint that we celebrate today, of course, most of us know because he wrote this beautiful liturgy that we serve. It's beautiful and affluent and some of the priest players that, which you don't hear, which are in the litanies, which are wrought with power. He prayed for many days in front of the icon, locked himself up in fasting, and asked the Lord to be given that mercy to have these words, and he was given that grace. He heard the appearance, of course, telling him to do so. St. Basil was a warrior throughout his life for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. He suffered mightily within his life, not only because of his own asceticism, but because the world was in chaos. Indeed, it's in chaos today. But this Arian heresy was taking over the kingdom, and certainly it was the majority of people at that time. So was the people who they called the spirit smashers, the Nevmatomaki. And he had to fight that the Holy Spirit was also God. Fight for that fact. But Basil would not compromise on this. If you read his letters, and there are two volumes that we have in English, rather beautiful. Over and over and over, you don't know which day, who was your friend, who wasn't, who was a heretic, who wasn't, it was shifting with whatever power was there, who was scared of the powers that be. And the local, the emperor, being furious with Basil, sent his prefect Modestos to go speak to Basil about this and to threaten him, if it must be, to turn away from this teaching and to grant peace, as he saw it, to the empire, at least to the, his, his episcopal see. He goes to him and begins to threaten him with all the things he can take away from him, where he'll send him, what he'll do to him physically. St. Basil responds to him and says, You can take everything away from me. You'll find nothing but some ragged old clothes and maybe some very valuable edifying books. You can cast me into exile, but God is everywhere. And wherever God is, I am at home. I am at peace. You can torture me. This only brings me to light because it leads me quickly to the kingdom of heaven to my Lord, to that name of Jesus that he sought throughout his entire life and everything that he did. It was after this speech, Modestos is furious and asks him, I has the audacity to speak to him that way, someone with power. St. Basil responds, you obviously is clear that you have never spoken to a bishop, a real bishop, because he says, in all things, we Christians are to show meekness and humility. In all things, that when it comes to the things of God, we show strength and courage. And do not back down from those things. But for us, for most of the time, we do have temptations like this. We do have people that talk to us against God. For the most part, we don't have emperors threatening us, at least at this point. There are certainly people in the world who do. Syria, Egypt. Kosovo, many places. People have to speak up for their faith. 
We have more subtle and dangerous temptations, as we've seen in this recent season, of course. The temptations to comfort, the temptations to materiality, the things are just gnawing us, but they seem good. They don't hurt so bad. It's not torture, it's not exile, it's not taking away anything. It's giving us something. This is nice, we like that. But we like it a little bit more than we like God sometimes. Or rather often we like it more than we like God. Well, just today, Lord, I'll just watch this thing I shouldn't watch today, or listen to this thing I shouldn't listen to, or read this thing I shouldn't listen to, or talk about this person I shouldn't talk about, or gossip, or judge. Just today, just for this moment. But that makes no place for God. That is not Paul knowing not a single thing but the name of Jesus. Because the name of the Jesus doesn't have any room for that. It only has room for his love, his mercy, his meekness, his humility, and all the fruits of the Spirit. The faith, the goodness, the self-control, the meekness. It doesn't have room for those sins. He accepts us in our repentance, but he wants us to cast those things aside. And in being circumcised, the Lord condescends to our level to undergo something by all rights he should have never had to undergo, but of his own will he allows us to happen. And that is the beautiful gift that he gives us, a true freedom. Freedom is not being able to do whatever you want. That's animals. We do whatever we want. I can eat whatever I want, I can do whatever I want, and act however I want. To be free is to have the freedom to turn your will over to Christ and to follow his will. That is the unique gift of us. We have the ability to turn our will over to God and freedom to do so. And in doing that, we find true humility, true freedom. Because Christ fills us up with himself and makes us radiant little Christ, <clears throat> anoints us with his Holy Spirit, fills us up with the name of Jesus, which obviously this is a great opportunity to preach about the Jesus prayer, but that would take far too long. We have the time to fill up our lives at every moment with Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me a sinner, every day, every moment, to call upon Christ, to remind ourselves of his presence, and all those Thoughts that are flooding into our minds all the time around us, most of which are useless, to redefine them, to transfigure them with the presence of that holy name of Jesus. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Amen. Amen.